Thanks, Kevin. So happy to have you all here. Really appreciate you taking the time out. So I have to begin um, just by saying that it all started back in about 2018 when I was interim dean. And have any of you heard of that children's book called Alexander and the Terrible Horrible No Good, Very Bad Day? That's how we started. So um, I was having a bad day, and I was so excited to go back to faculty and to do research. So I was on Medline, and I was doing some lit searching, and I found this paper. And this paper was written by, primary author was a woman named Anne. And I decided that I would see if Anne wanted to have a conversation. And she was from Edinburgh Napier University. So we had a team's call. And during that time, um, she, we kind of explored our research interests and our shared interests and hit it off right away in terms of just, you know, personality, et cetera. And she said, oh, by the way, did you know that we have a Fulbright Award here at, at Napier University? And of course, the rest is history. I applied for the award and, um, you know, there are some nuances for applying for Fulbright that I, that I learned along the way. So if any of you are interested, or know people who are interested, I would be happy to meet with one-on-one with -on -one just to talk about some of the um, particulars around that. But having a Fulbright Award really did a, several things for me. First of all, it really opened me up to meeting new colleagues around the world. And secondly, it really showed me a part of the world that I had never been to. And it also helped me shift from about seven years as an administrator back to a faculty position where I could really focus on research. So this presentation really includes a lot of photographs and not a very highly scripted uh, presentation, but I hope through the photographs to kind of talk through some of my experiences. So my host institution was Edinburgh Napier University. Um, the more well-known university in Edinburgh, Edinburgh, Scotland, is the University of Edinburgh, which is a very, very old institution. And Napier is a much newer institution that has three campuses. And I was in the one um, pictured here that is the newest one that focuses on health sciences and nursing. So very strong. Uh, uh, research and educational programming around exercise science, uh, physical therapy, human kinetics, and nursing. Huge nursing program, much larger than ours here. So one of the things that I was fortunate to do was connect with the cardiovascular health research team. Uh, and the members of that team are pictured here. They took me out for dinner fairly soon after I arrived. And my colleague, Coral, who is a co-author on a paper I'm writing uh, with, with this team, and you can, you can see the friendly faces. They were so welcoming to me on this team. And so they gave me a space to work. Um, we, we had conversation about research and ideas, and I watched them in sort of in their work be amazingly efficient in productivity with research. So I really also gained some ideas about how to build my own research team coming back here to a faculty role. I have to just point out this person here in the back right brown hair, Shona. She has become a very close friend of mine. So um, we have teams calls regularly and I miss her dearly. So just want to talk through some of the things that I did um, to really understand education and research in, in Scotland while I was there. This is Anne. This is the author of the paper that I uh, originally contacted. And um, interestingly, there's a lot of movement around universities in Scotland. Scotland is a small place. And so Anne was at Napier when I met her. And by the time I actually got to Edinburgh on my Fulbright, she had moved to the University of Glasgow as a faculty person. So this is, this is Glasgow, and it has such a Harry Potter-esque sort of feel to it, if you will. Such amazing old architecture everywhere. But you saw Napier University, how much more contemporary that is. So these old cities 
I think I was really amazed at, at the sort of interplay of new and old architecture um, throughout the city. So Fulbright UK, amazing organization. Not every Fulbright experience was like mine, and I feel extremely fortunate. So um, UK Fulbright very well supported and structured uh, support for the Fulbrighters, and therefore we had events that we were able to go to. So they paid for us to go to Cardiff, Wales. Um, this was in March, I believe. And uh, Roxy is from New York. She's a teacher. And uh, they had a special teaching uh, Fulbright program. And uh, Jeremy is from George Washington University uh, out east. So we bonded because we were all in Edinburgh at the same time. But at University of Wales, we did presentations. We met people from really all over the UK. So some of the other uh, things that I did while I was there, I did a presentation at the University of Dundee, and I was particularly interested in connecting with a researcher there, also a nurse, who was using the same theoretical model that I've been interested in uh, using, the health action process approach. And so I went to University of Dundee, I did a presentation there, met with the team, and really brainstormed some ideas around physical activity after stroke and some of the challenges that they had seen uh, and, and experienced trying to implement research with that population. So also participated in uh, activities at other universities and then was also invited to Belfast in Northern Ireland to do a presentation for a stroke boot camp, which was really kind of a clinically focused presentation and um, very different from, you know, just just fun being with clinicians, right? So lots of different opportunities to travel, um, to meet people, and to share ideas, which was pretty amazing. So I'll just pause for a minute and talk about the research that I did while I was there. So it was a bummer when my Fulbright was deferred for a year, but on retrospect, it actually was perfect. Because what I ended up doing was the same study uh, here in the pandemic, I did it on teams. I did interviews of people who had had stroke. And I really was able to test the interview guide and understand kind of whether I was really getting the kinds of information that I wanted to get when I, when I actually landed in Scotland. So, so that work done before I arrived in Scotland improved the research uh, because I was able to, to pilot that interview guide. and. Um, so the study that I did involved interviewing 13 stroke survivors. Um, I ended up with about half and half men and women and was really interested in understanding the experience of trying to be active after a stroke. And not just right after a stroke, but after formal rehab ends which has been an area of interest of mine for a while. And I think what's, what's really happened now is that I understand that this is where I need to spend my time, is that gap that people experience in support after they finish formal rehab and before they're really able to do, to, to incorporate sustained exercise and physical activity into their new way of being in the world, um, which is really what it is. Uh, for pe especially for people who have more significant disabilities. So I have to talk a little bit about just some of the fun I had. Can't just talk about the work. Um, I did a fair amount of traveling. I would probably have done a lot more traveling had there not been a pandemic going on. Uh, you saw that we wore we wore masks at times, and that was not much fun. There were still COVID out outbreaks at Fulbright events and things like that. But I'm just going to show a variety of pictures and just talk about some of the, the highlight memories that I have. So Dunfermline is um, the ancient capital of Scotland before, before things really grew and got big enough to need a bigger city for, to host the capital and the, pol the politicians. And on one particular day in March, 
Um, I did a coastal hike. The Fife Coastal Path runs a very long way up the eastern side of Scotland. And my friend Shona and her husband and I did about an eight mile hike. And this is just some of the, the views that we had. This stone structure is actually a, a changing room that was built, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And so people would go and they would, they would bathe in the ocean and, and they would change in this, this particular space. So the train ride um, made me think how much I wish we had trains here. You know, train travel in the UK is so easy and so fun. I mean, especially from someone, for someone like me, I came from you know, a small town in Wisconsin. Trains just m gave me so much freedom. Wish we had them here. So Isle of Skye, I did a four day tour um, to Isle of Skye in April, really wanting to experience the, an island because there are so many islands kind of around Scotland and I didn't feel like I really had time to get up to the far north. So I went to Skye, this was the, the group, it was a 18-passenger uh, van, and this was the group that was there from all over, from India, from London, from Chicago. Um, we had an absolutely fantastic time, and saw some of the most amazing scenery I've ever seen in my entire life. So Skye is um, just, Desolate in some ways, charming, um, full of kind of the arts and crafts of Scotland, fiber arts being big. And fiber arts is kind of something that is a personal passion of mine. I weave and I knit. Uh, and so traveling to a place that had some of those uh, cultural things to share was really great as well. So Port Tree Sky, we stayed a couple nights, and it's right on a loch, which is a lake. Um, and so beautiful, beautiful, uh, picturesque uh, boats and things, and amazing seafood. So I had some of the most delicious fish I've ever had, seemingly caught right out of the, the lakes uh, that morning. So I have to introduce to you our tour guide, Ewan, true Scotsman. So when he introduced himself the first day, he said, um, I'm a McLeod, I'm sorry, I'm a McDonald on my mother's side and I'm a McLeod on my father's side. So it kind of tells you, you know, really true Scotsman from the Highlands. So Ewan took us all over uh, Isle of Skye, but also all the way to and from played really fun Scottish music. Some kind of sad, actually. Some of the folk music talks about the history, and the history in Scotland is somewhat um, violent, and people, you know, just some of the stories were, were, were sad. Um, we saw from a distance the Coolin Mountains, you can see there. These are mountains to the Scots. To us, we might call them hills here in Colorado, uh, but very, very beautiful. And then a kilt rock, which looks a little bit like a kilt. And speaking of kilts, um, typically in Scotland, uh, in Edinburgh, kilts are worn for dress occasions, so uh, for weddings, for graduations, and things like that. Um, but occasionally, just randomly, you might see um, a man walking down the street with a kilt on. But he wore, um, Ewan wore a kilt for us um, on, the, on the travel so we could see the kind of the traditional, traditional wear. So the Elandonan Castle um, on Loch Duick um, was the most beautiful castle I've ever seen inside. There are lots, hundreds and hundreds of castles in Scotland alone, um, not even touching on the, the other parts of the UK. But Elandonan Castle was actually decimated during a war, and they invested um, in the early 1900s to basically recreate it. And so you could walk through it and see kind of a recreated 
environment with you know just some of the beautiful tapestries, lots of weapons, lots of knives and swords and things, uh, which I guess kind of kind of depicts the Scottish way of of uh, of fighting for their rights historically. And then back to Edinburgh, where I was living uh, for those five months. So this is a picture of um, the Edinburgh Castle, um, taken from a park very near to where I stayed. And you can see kind of down below, there's, um, it looks to me like maybe a football uh, practice, uh, football meaning soccer, uh, here, uh, but also there's a big, um, it was a big stadium and they had cricket matches and things like that going on as well. So uh, my flat was on a garden level, absolutely the most charming little place I could have asked for, um, and located in a very safe part of Edinburgh, um, and that's relative because Edinburgh is pretty safe compared to some of the big cities we have here in the US. Um, and I might just diverge a minute and talk about something that's, um, I think, important to just sort of mention is that, you know, guns are, are not present in Scottish culture. So unless you're going hunting, um, nobody owns a gun. And in fact, the police do not carry guns. So if they have a violent situation going on, which is very rare, they call in a gun unit. So they call in police who are specifically trained to carry guns, and it's not every police officer that's there. So there, there were lots of questions. I got lots of questions about our society. Um, and so I just mentioned that, you know, to be in a place that doesn't have guns, that just, it's just not even part of the, the public, you know, sort of, thought was, was really um, pretty awesome, frankly. So Edinburgh Castle, just wanted to kind of provide a little bit more of the kind of the, the picture around it. So I didn't actually go to Edinburgh Castle until my sister and her husband and my husband came to visit. So I kind of saved that till the end. And it was a beautiful day when we went and you can see that the um, changing, of the, changing of the guard there um, is happening. And if you look at the staircase, so this is called a close. Um, the stairs lead up in, in central Edinburgh, the old part of the city center. These stairways, which are like, uh, not unlike the incline, Maybe not quite that bad, <laughs> but at least you're at sea level here. But not very many people were taking these stairs, I will tell you. We, I took them, um, and I think I had a little bit of altitude advantage, at least for the first month I was there. But these, these center part of Edinburgh with these stairs um, provided a very different view of the city. Uh, and there was a lot of history around how people lived in the city center. So lower income people on the bottom, and then as people were going up into the building, they, they were more wealthy and had a much better um, living situation. So because of my interest in the fiber arts, I delved a little bit into what was happening. And this is um, Kitty. So I met Kitty actually when I originally went to go to a Weaver's Guild um, meeting at a church. I took the bus about 45 minutes to get there and lo and behold the meeting was canceled because somebody had COVID. <laughs> but I met this woman Kitty who is in her 80s. She is a former teacher extremely interested in engaging in conversation around um, ideas and very passionate about teaching spinning. So the location here um, is the, a local uh, farm that's in the city center called the City Farm. And we are actually in the reptile room. And so they would put us in the reptile room to learn spinning and people would come through and watch. So Kitty would do these demos once a week. So several times I went and Kitty got me started on a drop spindle. 
um, learning how to spin wool, and I can't say I love it, but I was so thrilled to be part of that group because they were women um, who just had a lot of ideas about living in Edinburgh and had been to New York. They, they had all traveled to the US, so they all kind of knew, knew something about where I was coming from. So my husband Barry came for the last five weeks and we were fortunate to be able to travel for three of those weeks and then we got COVID. Um, but just a couple of the fun adventures that we had, uh, we went to Loch Ness um, and Inverness and we did a boat tour across Loch Ness, did not see Nessie. Um, but one of the things that was part of the tour that we um, uh, participated in was a trip to um, the battlefield where Bonnie Prince Charlie took his uh, Jacobite soldiers and there was a massive killing of the Scottish, uh, Scottish Jacobites. And so what you see in the center here is a stone memorial for one of the clans that died of the men that died in that particular um, clash. And this was Clan Fraser. And the funny thing is that people leave flowers at this particular one because of Outlander. So um, our tour guide was laughing about that, so I took a picture of that. But it was also, you know, really, really a moving sort of place. Um, the Battle of Culloden was really a piece of history in Scottish lore that is kind of difficult to read about because they were set up to fail and many, many Scots died. So this, when you're in on the battlefield, which we were, they have flags showing where the Scots were standing and where the English were standing and where the battle actually took place. And so it really makes it very, sort of moving. And then you see all these memorials for the clans that were, were there. So this is a picture of, of Urquhart Castle, another castle on uh, Loch uh, Ness um, that is pretty much completely ruined. You can walk through, but there are no, kind of no walls left, but it was very beautiful still. So one of my favorite pictures of uh, the scenery um, as we're in the, tour in the tour bus and traveling around uh, towards Inverness, but also towards Skye, was Glencoe. Glencoe is a vast area of Scotland um, that is mountains and valleys and rivers and lochs, and just so beautiful. Almost, almost I can hardly even describe how beautiful. Um, so when they film some of the, the uh, portions of Harry Potter, they picked Glencoe for Hagrid's hut. So we passed by the area that Hagrid's hut had been, and apparently they had to take it down because kids were going and causing trouble as kids do. Um, but this is, you know, the beauty of, of Scotland right here. And then could not leave out the Highland Coos. Um, these are the cattle that are predominant historically in Scotland uh, and used for beef. And they're just adorable. I mean, they're just adorable. So we were, you can get pretty close to them, you know, up against the fence. They're very, you know, tame to humans at this point. And so uh, we did get some really great pictures. And they're kind of an iconic thing about Scotland. So people um, think of Scotland and think of Highland Coos. So I had a visit from a couple of princes here on the left, my sons. So they're standing right below Stirling Castle. Nate and Brady came for about 10 days. Um, we had a fantastic time, and I think they have the they have the bug for um, European travel for sure. And then 
we were not all there together. Barry came later, and so wanted to include him in, uh, in the presentation. And then the timing of my visit there was great for the Platinum Jubilee. So um, the, I was in Edinburgh. I did not go to London. I, there was no way I would have gone to London for that. It was crazy in London. Um, but what they did was they kind of brought the Jubilee to the people of Edinburgh. So in the city center, right below Edinburgh Castle is this beautiful park. And they had a big screen that they had brought in and they basically showed the parade. So the picture here is a picture of a screen uh, of the, the carriage that brought the queen. And my friend Lois, who um, joined me for a picnic in the park to kind of watch the festivities. They had a band come in and yeah, it was, it was pretty fun. Uh, Lois is from Australia and Lois came right around the time I did, maybe a little bit before to take a new position at Napier University. She's a nurse midwife and um, a PhD, so she's, she's starting some new programs there. And so she came with me to watch the Platinum Jubilee. And then the picture of the queen is, of course, not in real, real time. That was on the screen as well, but I had to take her picture for posterity. So just kind of coming full circle back to my part of Edinburgh. Um, I stayed in a small area called Stockbridge, which is kind of considered what they told me kind of the bohemian part of Edinburgh. I'm not sure if I would use that term, but it was definitely had a charm to it that other parts of the city didn't. And I will say that the city is quite diverse in its feel architecturally and um, the kinds of cultural things that are going on in, in sport things. But anyway, this gives you a snapshot of my little corner of the world. So I was, um, a week or so after I got there, I bought a bike, which made me so happy because I would bike on these beautiful trails, you know, 10, 20 miles in the morning. And then I was right on the Water of Leith walkway. Leith is a town that's right on uh, the water just east of Stockbridge. And so you could walk a couple miles on the waterway or, you, or the walkway, or you could ride your bike. And this is kind of what I would see when I would be riding my bike along the walkway. So just absolutely an amazing place to spend some time thinking about my research, meeting people doing similar kinds of research, and trying to decide how I wanted to spend the last 10 years or so of my, of my time as a, as a worker. So just a, a final couple pictures here just to kind of show how beautiful um, this place was. The Three Sisters of Glencoe, mountains, mountains. <laughs> and then my friend Anne, who will, I'm sure, remain a friend forever. She, um, she has a son who's finishing up high school. Uh, and so we have, you know, we have some inter interesting connections around having sons and being nurses. In my neighborhood, I swam at a place called Glenogle Baths, which was a, a very old bathhouse, uh, hundreds of years old, that they converted into really what is kind of like a YMCA. And I swam pretty regularly for a couple of months. And it was great at the beginning because it was still the pandemic, but then once the pandemic kind of got lifted a bit, I was ending up in a lane with six other people. And I struggled with that because I think I'm not as coordinated as some. Um, and I found, I found it to be a struggle. So I also, right near my place, I had um, some swan, uh, are they ducklings? Some swans um, born, and I watched them from the time that their mom was sitting on the nest to when they were born, and when I left, they were about this big. 
so they grew really fast. But this was my neighborhood, the Stockbridge Market, uh, Farmer's Market, every week, about three minutes from my little flat. And then the Edinburgh Botanical Gardens, um, five minutes from my flat, huge space of city uh, land that has been converted to just amazing flowers, trees that changed so much over the course of five months that I was there. And then lastly, favorite things. I have to just share a few favorite things. We'll start on this right side. So box tea. Box tea is something I had in Northern Ireland, in Belfast. Um, it, it looks like an omelet, but actually it is made out of potato. And it's filled with different kinds of things. I've had it filled with smoked cod. And it was amazing. So that was one of my favorite things. And that was from Belfast. In the middle is a date oat bar. This is at Edinburgh Botanical Gardens. So I might have had a few of these over the course of time since it was only five minutes from my place. But it was one of the first things that Anne, uh, when we went for coffee the very first time I met her, I had an oat date bar and it was like, the, it was an incredible sort of hour of my day, hour of my, of my life really, meeting this new person, having this incredible gluten-free dessert, which made me happy. Um, and then finally, of course, if we think of Scotland, we think of pubs, we think of whiskey, um, and they do have very good whiskey. But being from Wisconsin, I'm always sort of drawn to the beer, and, and one thing I just have to share is how much further ahead Scotland is in beer and creating beer that is drinkable by even people who have gluten sensitivity like me. So this particular brewery, all of the beers use a particular enzyme called Clarix, and it reduces the gluten to a point, it brings it below a threshold that a lot of people who have challenges with gluten can enjoy without any issues at all. So I'm on sort of this mission now <laughs> to share you know, how this little enzyme that we can put in the beer that doesn't change the taste, that you know, doesn't have to be super expensive, can make a difference for a lot of people. And, and the beer there was fantastic. So what's next? Real quick, um, so this idea of a gap in support. After people finish stroke rehab, formal stroke rehab, and then before they really are able to think of a life or build a life that includes regular physical activity, which will then reduce their risk of another stroke or reduce their risk of other bad things. This is the window, the gap that I am passionate about trying to fill. So talking to um, the 13 people that I interviewed, talking to 12 that I interviewed before I went to Scotland, I'm really quite interested in exploring this idea of using recumbent tricycles, uh, which are a very safe uh, mode of exercise depicted here. That's me during the pandemic, cycling here in town with a group. Um, so we have, uh, my colleague Bryn Adamson and I have submitted an R15 to NIH, and we really want to kind of get started on this, this new intervention looking at um, this, this trike cycling. We have some impressive colleagues here, uh, partners here in town. We have a cycle shop that specializes in these cycles that many people don't even know about. We have uh, groups that are taking people out on trikes, but the people who've had stroke don't know about these resources. So um, heading towards working on some intervention work in that area. Still working on a publication with my colleagues in the UK and hoping to get back there soon for another adventure. So with that, um, are there any questions? Thanks for being here. Appreciate you coming. And uh, I'll be working in this.
Syria for a while. 